You're listening to In Deep Shift, the show about diving into topics that tempt the mind to merge with possibility, to be open to new realities, balancing reason with soul, a common sense approach to creating love, excitement, and clarity, creating a whole new reality right now. Follow me at ryankeys.com. everybody for being here and we are going to talk about uh, telepathy and some basics about telepathy and how it can assist us um, i like to think of it as spiritual technology and how we are going to be able to um, advance ourselves, um, but also to in it's like insurance it's like having food storage or water storage or having battery extra batteries for your flashlight this is the same thing and like i had said as an example, this is like uh, Tom Hanks in Castaway when he was talking to Wilson. It was one of the lifelines that he had created, which was kind of a, a parallel reality, creating uh, a volleyball as a as a as a persona. And telepathy is a lot like that, and we actually use it every day. We don't realize it. Um, a lot of um, people that might not want the average person accessing telepathy or understanding it. Well, we've made it um, cartoonish. We've made it, um, we've blown it out. We've like made it something that's almost ridiculous. And if you were to talk about telepathy to somebody, they might cringe. They might look at you like you've lost your mind. Um, but I often think even when I see some homeless people that are um, in the throes of schizophrenia, perhaps there's actually some moments when they're actually having a telepathic conversation with something or someone because they're really into it. And I know you know, mental health is very interesting. I've studied a lot of mental health due to my um, dental degree, but I know that one thing about mental health is is it's evolved very slowly and it hasn't really kept up with technology where we could scan someone's brain and see different aspects with some type of like CT scan and see, well, this is how the brain actually is working and this is some of the parameters. I mean, they have some of that, but it hasn't really taken advantage of the fullness of science where you can look at somebody and, and break down a blood vessel in their heart and figure out how to, uh, to open that vein. You know, I feel that we've just kind of created a, um, a constituency of medicating everybody rather than finding the meaning of what's going on. And that medication is, is not necessarily magic, right? It's not a magic bullet. So, and this is also due to the fact, even when Ronald Reagan in California set a wave across the nation by closing mental health facilities for whatever reason and opening more prisons. So I feel like that that was, and not to be political, but you know, that was part of this that's created um, some distance between finding and adapting our, our emotional intelligence and our higher self. Cause a lot of people have nowhere to go. Um, and even this is a good teaching tool. Um, and I'll explain that in one of the aspects. So in this it's obviously it says beginner's guide to telepathy, but we're always all beginners, including myself. I just wrote it down and I put what is telepathy and um, some basic definitions are communication between minds and communicating through means other than the senses as by the direct exchange of thought, communication at a distance via thoughts, feelings, and emotions. Um, and that's just a, a basic diagram. Obviously, telepathy could be um, in, imprinting pictures in the mind. It could be remote viewing. It could be um, clear audience, clear sentience. It could be um, uh, lucid dreaming, contacting and creating a link with dreaming. Um, yeah, shamans do this very often. Also, there are um, drugs as uh, I've done with ayahuasca. And I know that that is also a form of a telepathic connection with source um, near death. I've done that twice, which it wasn't too fun. 
And that's, you know, creating a version of telepathy because anytime that you're tapped in, like I love when Spock used to like do the Vulcan mind meld and he would be like, oh yes. And he would like talk to like rocks or something. <laughs> it's like, wait, no. Okay. So now, yeah, I remember you talked to a blob in a TV, one of the TV episodes by touching it and touching his head. And uh, yeah, this, that's a funny technique. I'll, 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 we'll talk about that a, a little bit on, but so even um, Reiki is telepathy. Prayer is telepathy. Um, and then, um, you know, just even a hug is actually telepathy. Um, opening the door for somebody to go in front of you, like I like to do that, that's, your, that's telepathic in a way. So telepathy, it, it, it can't it be a super uh, gift, like, you know, like a Harry Potter style thing or like a superhero, like the Eternals. Can you talk through your mind? Maybe you could, but, you know, I, I think, you know, movies like Firestarter or Stephen King, um, they, their intent wasn't to maliciously uh, move us away from our gifts, but it did kind of because it created a kind of a joking atmosphere when it comes to actually the spiritual journey. And when you go back to many of the Sufis or many of the, the um, Sagomas or many of the um, old experts that are like um, in India, like you've got your gurus, you've got, you know, you've got um, the Quanderos, you've got uh, Shaman, they've always been telepathic. And I think that is there, a, is there a part of it that could be hokey and jokey and unprovable, like Bill Murray doing the intro to Ghostbusters when he's shocking the guy? Yes, there is that, that moment of this could be a little hokey. But I think if we look at it that, like I've laid it out, we'll see that it's actually very realistic. So, and I put why use telepathy? And uh, number one, to exchange internal feelings, ideas, and intentions. When you don't know what to say, for example, with Reiki and prayer as a form of telepathy, um, it's not always possible to say uh, things we need or want to someone due to fear or rejection. So you could use this as a uh, kind of um, energy exchange to, like through intention, uh, to increase the conversation with the soul and the spirit realms. So telepathy could be something very personal, very you know, communicating with God's source or whatever it is that you go to. Um, it allows us to practice forgiveness and unconditional love. Um, this is kind of related. It says another way to give and give and gain closure to situations that may or may not allow for it in the physical realms. So telepathy has it's an ability to bring back your power to your central self um, without the knowledge, because you can speak to someone's soul and you can speak to their heart rather than having to get uh, through layers and layers of uh, erroneous self-defense mechanisms that have been laid through their experiences, right? So um, also an ability to send energetic messages at a distance. Um, I feel that that is a, a really good thing for us as a group, even here, learning you know, how to send um, energy without um, acknowledgement. So telepathy is not necessarily something where you're going to go be like, um, I'm going to send a message to Veronica and Veronica is going to call me in 10 minutes. That could be an expressed version of it, but don't let the idea that if Veronica doesn't call, create um, a lack of confidence with that you sent Veronica a message, right? Because it's really, it's energetic, it's magnetic, and it's, it's in a realm that we exist that are on an atomic level. Um, even CERN is, is uh, experiencing these things. CERN is utilizing this type of technology to open wormholes and portals and God knows what they're doing. But this is also part of that. Um, and then, you know, obviously, uh, like in the vein of Spider-Man, when, um, you know, uh, Peter Parker's uncle said, to whom much is given, much is required. And obviously, ignorance is bliss because you don't know better. But when you do, what happens is, it's not that you have to be better, but it's that you want to, you want to be better. It's not like, so when, the more you know, the more you become aware, the more you gain an insight and information or in abilities and understanding. It's not that you're suddenly held to a different level of, ex, of um, expectations by God or source or other people. It's that you would want to grow into that. You would want to actually be the best. Like I was saying, like I didn't know, um, like that lady said, I didn't know my dog 
you know, I didn't know that not getting surgery was an issue. But then when I got the surgery, I realized not ever getting the surgery would be extremely detrimental to him. And the surgery is actually making him so much better. So when I gain awareness and insight, and when I gain uh, a, a really good intuitive connection with myself and my surroundings and other people, I should actually just become better. Not because anybody needs me to be better or anybody's guilting me to be better, but because it's just the best for me. Like when I become aware that a, an apple is much better for me than a Snickers bar, it doesn't mean that anybody's going to judge me and sit on my shoulder and say, don't eat that Snickers. But it means that I would understand that, hey, this I have the opportunity to eat an apple right now, which my body is going to love me for, and it's going to actually become part of my body. It's not going to spike anything, not going to create any detrimental effects. So that it's just, I would want to have that desire. And this would also be about creating a telepathic connection to yourself, right? Really listening to that inner voice. You're, so discernment is telepathy, right? So using discernment is one of the highest uses of telepathy, that little voice, that gut voice inside. Um, now, some of the dangers that we could find about telepathy, the first danger is uh, adhering to the myth, adhering to the, the, the falsities that telepathy means I can read someone's mind and, and do malicious things to them, or that I can curse somebody. I know people want to think that curses are real, but a curse is actually an implied promise that someone receives a service for in, indirectly, right? So a curse has to be received in some way. Generally, when people are cursed, it's because there's a part of them that's, that's somebody could have witnessed that's very empathic and they're just riding on the coattails of it. But like even like a vampire, right? There's a lot of examples and things in literature and in history of of different ailments and things. So even like a vampire, it has to ask permission to come into your house. So your house, your, your human is sacred. So anybody needs to ask permission to enter. Now, if you give them permission through action, intention, or acceptance, obviously they're going to come in. But we are a sovereign being. And I think that a curse is an exercise of a telepathic connection but we're allowing it to be there for whatever reason. Maybe our higher self is there's a school that we're going to for some reason, or it could be some type of self-destructive behavior that we haven't addressed. Um, but nobody has a power to put anything over you. Um, that'd be like saying, even if somebody tried, took my life, they don't have power over my soul. So the physical form is, is we relinquish it, right? We're only in it for a short term. So a, a danger of telepathy could be a creation of the non-physical one-sided bond if the intention is not pure, which is that kind of a cursed thing, right? Or like a, a fantasy, or when somebody facilitates like um, um, that fatal style of attraction or obsession. And that's actually also a telepathic connection. It's, it may be single-sided though. And it's an obsession. And this is a non-physical one-sided bond. And that's, that's a danger of telepathy. And because telepathy is an extension of empathy. And you know, even we can be sympathetic to a situation and we bring it back home to us, like bringing home a spirit from like, a, like they say, like a poltergeist when you go into a haunted house. We may have become sympathetic to a spirit's cause or plight or a situation and we bring thing, something home. That's also a version of telepathy to the negative. Um, codependency on suppressing actual verb verbalization of needs. We can become codependent on telepathy. If we find that it works, we may feel like, hey, we've got like, think of it like um, if a man or a woman taps into their physicality of being sexy. So they know a certain way that they can send a body language or a body signal gets a certain resolve, gets a certain result. This is a little bit of a dangerous path with a telepathic presence. Because when somebody knows, hey, this is my best side, or this is when I give that look, right? Or when, they, when an actor takes a pause, they're sending a telepathic signal. Now, when you, when you are codependent on these things, or when you're codependent on, um, I don't, I'm going to send Veronica a message because I know that if I say it, she's going to hit the roof. Or I know if I say something, maybe she's going to be sensitive to it and she's going to hit the roof. 
So I just send love and happiness and well-being underneath the table and like, boom, here's my, my, my message. And I don't have to say it. I don't have to apologize. I'll send the apology via telepathic connection. <laughs> that's not necessarily going to work. That's, that's a little bit of a, that's suspect. That's, it's not really dangerous, but it's, it's detrimental to the connection, to the communication and to the, the evolution of the experience. Now, if Veronica wasn't willing to receive it or wasn't in a place where I could send it to her, maybe she'd already passed on. I could do it that way. And that would be an option, but um, also creating undue influence upon others. Like I was saying with like, you know, using your sexiness, your sex appeal to your advantage, using your um, uh, energetic energy to your advantage. Um, nothing should ever be used as an advantage over someone. Um, it should always incorporate the benefit of everybody. So, the, and that's one of the cool things. Like if, um, if you think about it, if we were to do things, it, it benefits us, but it would also have to benefit somebody else. The world would be a completely different place. Right. Um, then also, um, another little bit of a detriment to telepathy could be opening up deep vulnerability before self-connection and confidence is fostered. And this is one of the predisposers to when people become a, um, fixated or um, go into the realms of fantasy. Um, this can be also that twin flame style connection that we see a lot of, like I just coach somebody and they're on their fifth twin flame. So, <laughs> so obviously they're pretty hot. So they're burning up. They got twin flame energy all over the place. They're, they've gone through five already. So it's supposed to be that singular event that happens one time, but okay. So five, number five, number six, number seven. It's like, a, it's, I feel like I'm like at an auction, but so that can bring in this idea because there's something they're missing, right? There's telepathy is going to open up your vulnerability and it's going to open up your, your, your connection. But unless you're able to foster a sense of self-awareness and confidence while doing so and open the lines of communication to where it's beneficial for both parties, it could be a bit dangerous. Um, now we've talked a lot about that, but so a couple ways we could recognize telepathy just in your everyday life or your everyday world. Number one is synchronicities. We've all had it. We've all had an 11-11 moment. Mine's one, four, three, but we've all had a synchronicity. We've all been, um, I, I've worked with several people that have synchronicities even while we're talking, or I'll have an aha moment, right? Like, I think Oprah is the queen of synchronicities because she's like, oh, aha. <laughs> it's just like, it's, it's, so it's like that moment that you have that uh, awareness that, wait, okay, this is something special. This is something going on. I feel something. I feel a connection. Um Another one is premonitions, right? Um, you can get a premonition. premonition. Um, it's not always uh, going to have a, a detailed list of what's going to happen, but it could be a premonition. Like um, when I was 21 uh, and I got my face crushed on the right side, I told my mom before I went out, I feel like I shouldn't go because I feel like something bad was going to happen. Now, it was a feeling. I didn't see, I didn't have a, a depiction. I didn't have a detailed review of what was going to happen, but it was that gut feeling. And now that I've learned, that's my higher self speaking to me telepathically. Another way is, I like to say, is hindsight or retrocognition. When we say, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. when you can look back and you can see the, 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 the gleam on, God, I shouldn't have done that. So what's happening is, your past is speaking to you. Your past self is sending you a telepathic message of confirmation to your present self. This is what we learned. This is how we know. This is the lesson. Because believe it or not, as many of you already know, and as I've worked with hundreds and hundreds of people, there's a lot of people that cannot look back and have hindsight where they can actually learn something. And that's why we get into repetitious patterns and we repeat things over and over because we're not speaking to because see, it's actually not our past self. It's our present self, but there's no past, present, and future. There's only now. And so telepathically, you're speaking to you in this moment when you're having hindsight. And it's an observational moment. So uh, retrocognition is a huge example of telepathy and when you have hindsight. Another one is awareness, which is a deep connection to a surrounding sensations, like an electromagnetic pool or experiencing electromagnetic feel, like um, if you've ever been in a haunted house and you're like, whoa, shit. Or if you've ever seen, you know, you walk through a spiritual place like a church, the church has been charged with uh, not Christianity, but energy, 
right? So it's like we often confuse God with the religion, but so a, a spiritual place, whether it's in Bali, whether it's a synagogue or, uh, you know, whether it's a, a shrine or whatever it is, is charged with this sensation of an electromagnetic field. And that is everyone sending a telepathic signal of welcome. And they're sending it through time and space. So the energy stays in imprints. So telepathic connection is also, it can imprint on people. And this could be where we, we have this connotation that we can be cursed. You can be blessed as well. So, but it's whatever you want to do with energy. I could walk into a shrine and say, wow, I really feel this. It's making me feel uncomfortable and walk out and take it as a negative. But if I'm constantly in connection with my hindsight or my retro retrocognition and I'm understanding synchronicities and I know telepathy is a good thing, then suddenly I'm connected with a sp spirit realm across generations, across years and time and space. And we're all connected in that moment. And I can actually feel the vibration of their energy. So this is that amazing idea of what belief was established on. And I put also situational stimulation. So when you watch a movie, like when you watch something and you have like that moment, that connection with the character, that's a telepathic connection, not only with the idea of the character that's been created, but also the actor that's portraying it. And then it's retroactive into your, most of the time when we see, like if we watch the notebook or we watch something, we're having a retrocognition moment of hindsight, even though we may not be aware of where it's located in our, in our timeline or in our past life or parallel life, we're having a cognitive moment where we're having a telepathic connection with the, the, that, that energetic field. So I think it's actually really fun because when you feel moved in a movie, there's multiple reasons why. And once you start having that level of awareness, your connection deepens, and then you realize that movies actually are magic, which is kind of funny. Um, and then just to break it down on a, a, on a gut-based level, uh, goosebumps, god bumps, gut feelings, little voices, and lucid dreaming. Lucid dreaming is telepathy to the 10th power. Because what's happening is, is you're opening up your psyche and your soul is taking a stroll, going through your Akashic records are going through your life experience and helping you evolve a solution like a quantum computer does in different dimensions for, your, for whatever it could be allocated for you when you wake up. And the idea is that when we'll practice this a little bit later on is um, utilizing the dream world as a telepathic teaching school. And um, if you've ever done ayahuasca or done uh, anything like that or had a near-death moment, that's actually already very prevalent in your life and you've already done it and you may not even realize it. Um, so when we move on, um, how do we prepare for telepathy? Number one way, meditation. And why is that important for telepathy? Because it's clearing the mind and it's opening the conduit for, for a connection, right? So meditation is um, one of the key ways. And because I like to think of what happened. So in meditation, you're, you're not trying to get anywhere or do anything. You're going to nowhere and nothing. And what happens in that space is it's completely open. Like, uh, I don't like to use Bible quotes, but it's a good quote because it says, let there be light. So God said, let there be light. So what was there before light? Nothing, darkness, emptiness. So God actually existed in the darkness and the emptiness. So when we go to this space of nothingness, we're actually going really to God, right? Or going to source. So this is a, a, an understanding of how to increase your ability to hear. So what meditation is actually doing is giving you um, an awareness of, for your um, ability to hear, ability to hear with your heart, your soul, your mind, and your physical body. Um, visualization is another uh, great preparation for telepathy. And I put exercise in the third eye to create portals. Now we've done a couple of things. Uh, if you follow me before, I've talked about this, where you can create um, imaginary portals or conduits to people by creating a person that's parallel at this day and time somewhere in the world and giving them clothes, shoes, um, uh, an accent, a haircut, a family, a job, a house. And you create this person as if you're creating or writing a story in a book. And what you're doing is you're creating a parallel reality. That's why we'll see a lot of times authors or movies do seem to be a lot like other things, including ourselves. So these are ways to create portals to people 
that are part of your experience and could be part of your soul family. And you may never come in contact with them in the physical world, but you're creating and sending information to them. And what you're doing is, is you're creating, um, it's like when, like I only have spectrum, but when I was able to get Starlink, now my, my connection, I have, I have choices. So what you're doing is, is you're creating a parallel connection to another person that you may or may not ever meet in another place of the world. So you've just increased your capacity for connection in the spiritual world. You're creating that grid. You're expanding your space and uh, increase emotional awareness and allowing the emotions to flow. Uh, emotions. Um, so the interesting thing is, so feelings, so a feeling um, is the precursor of emotions. So a feeling is, uh, is what happens. Like if you get angry, that's not the emotion, right? Anger is the feeling. The emotion is what you understand about the feeling and how you utilize the feeling as a function. So becoming emotionally intelligent or allowing emotional awareness is when we take feelings and we, we allow feelings to become um, positive in our life and powerful in our life. And we understand that um, a feeling, there's no bad feelings, right? Depression isn't bad. Um, anger isn't bad. So there's no bad feeling. There's only just, there's only just negative responses. There's negative actions associated on the feeling once the emotion has taken shape and become an action. So the emotion and emotional awareness is a key to telepathy by understanding how we allow the emotions to flow through us. And that you can always make the choice for the emotion to go with the flow of life, but understand the flow of life is not always good or bad. Sometimes the flow can be distance. So sometimes you can actually create emotional awareness by pulling away from a situation rather than getting angry and doing something detrimental to you or to someone else to pull away or to detach is actually in a, a level of emotional intelligence. But we hear detachment as a negative thing so much. Well, oh, he's detached. Well, maybe it's because he was going to say something that you would have never been able to recover from, or it could have gotten both of you into a situation that would have been bad. So sometimes detachment is actually good. Um, but there, it's also can be bad, but you know, I, I'm, I come from the thought that everything can be um, moved to the positive um, and positive doesn't necessarily mean that it's good. Positive just means in the, in the plus side where it's an experience that could actually benefit both of us. doesn't mean it's going to be a good experience, but it could still be beneficial. So another thing that will increase and help you to prepare for telepathy is breathing programs. Um, much like Wim Hof or um, Dao Zhong breathing or yoga has that uh, the nostril breathing where you breathe through one nose and you, you blow out through one nose. I don't really do that because I have sinuses, so I might blow something out. So I tend to like dial that one down, but I do Wim Hof and I do Dao Zhong breathing. I do um, belly breathing, which also helps too, um, because most of us are depleted through oxygen and we don't even realize it because we're designed to breathe shallow because we're always in a height, heightened state or a fight or flight state. So we breathe very shallow to run. But when we breathe deeper and we breathe into our belly, into our navel, what happens is, is we breathe in that, what I like to call a knowing. Because with oxygen and more oxygen comes more information. Because oxygen, there's water in oxygen and water carries information, much like a USB chip. Um, anything that's oxygenated also helps to elevate the stored information that's already in the body helps to also alleviate oxidation of the body, mind, and soul because we're oxygenating. Um, and then to match your intentions with your actions. So understanding, starting to practice, like when I said, when I open the door, I send a beautiful message, even if the person doesn't say thank you. So I'm matching my intention and action. So that my intention to open the door is to be loving and, and giving without receiving anything. So the, the art of giving is kind of really good for this as an example, matching intention with action. Um, I like to do this as a game too, uh, color matching. And I know that sounds kind of odd. It sounds like it's like coloring as a kid. Um, it's learning to exercise your chakra expression with a daily intention. So if you're feeling heavy in the heart, wear green and focus on the color green throughout the day. If you're feeling like distant, you don't want to talk and you don't want to be social, pick something blue and focus on like looking up at the sky or looking at things that are blue, like go to the ocean. And what will happen is, is you go. So when you feel like you don't want to speak, that's because something's trying to speak to you. 
And that's why the throat chakra is blue and the sky is blue. Because a lot of times I feel that the throat chakra is not just for speaking, but for listening. You know, what's interesting is we even like think of words, right? Even words, but we listen with our words. Like when you read, uh, you're, you're reading, but you're, you're listening with your eyes. So there's, there's multiple. And so one, one aspect can have multiple avenues. So color matching, and that's an example. Um, if you're feeling, you know, if you're feeling like you don't have friends or family, wear red. And if you'll notice, like you'll often see, like even in the matrix, the lady in red, the lady in the red dress. So she stood out. He, she drew his attention. So when you don't have friends or when you feel you're alone and you wear a red tie, a red dress, you're going to stand out and you're going to draw attention. You're going to draw people to you. When you, same thing, red, like a, like, or sacral, when you are sitting around a fire in the middle of something, you'll draw people to you like a bonfire, right? So it, it, these connotations are very organic when you start to really break it down. And I learned these, this kind of, like, this was from sitting with a shaman that I knew in Mexico for a lot, but, um, and then practice listening and active listening, the art of listening. Um, practice listening would be like what you all are doing now. You're just kind of listening to me talk. And even though when you want to say something, you're like, ah, uh, we're, we're doing questions a little bit later. So I will hang on to it and I'll write it down. And then active listening is when uh, many of you know already, because many of you have psychology backgrounds or degrees or classes. Active listening is when I, like in sales, I tend to, I can repeat things so that I'm clear and I gain clarity and the person knows I'm listening to them. Then I'm increasing a bond, which is building rapport and rapport is very, very much part of telepathy. Um, and then dream prep prior to sleep. This is something we'll do a whole class on to prepare ourselves for dream traveling, dream awareness and um, fire rituals. I learned a lot of these from Violdo and how we can learn. I call it the birthday, the birthday blowout, right? So it's like, and we'll talk about that. We'll do a whole class on that maybe in two weeks, um, but dream prep prior to sleep. And then um, how do we practice telepathy? This is a big one. Number one way, creating pictures in meditation to build your auric field. So um, visualization is building a field, right? You're building a portal. Um, number two, identifying emotional states and the physical and energetic response to that state. So, you know, like it's situational, like if anybody has ever taken martial arts, or if you've ever been an athlete and you vision yourself, uh, completing the task, or if you envision yourself in martial arts or self-defense, you run through scenarios. That scenario is a state of telepathic connection to an action. So when that happens, your body pulls that up from from retrocognition, which is telepathy, to your Akashic records, because all of the things that you have are stored in the field above you. So you're telepathically tapping in and taking information out of the cloud and pulling it into you right now, like Keanu Reeves downloading Kung Fu. And so this is a, a very um, good way to practice is by identifying emotional states and bringing responses to that. So hypotheticals, thinking of how I would respond, you know, doing things starting your day before you leave your bed, right? Joe Dispenza is big on that too. Um, practice rehearsing the action intention that you're wanting to relay. This is a continuation of that one. So for example, when sending a message, practice sending it to general people during the day. Utilize loving intention and gratitude. Think of it like broadcasting your state of mind or state of being as a field around you at points in the day to shift the energy in the room. So become a lighthouse, so to speak right? Become the bonfire. Imagine yourself on fire like Johnny Flame in the Fantastic Four. Here I am. I'm, I'm emanating a color. I'm emanating a, a, a certain energy center. I'm emanating a vibration. I'm emanating something. So I'm practicing becoming that. It's almost like if I could shape shift, I'm practicing. And I think this is probably where the whole shape shifting idea came in from the cabal and all this other stuff, like the, the craziness, right? So shape shifting is energy shifting. It doesn't mean that somebody's necessarily ch changing from a, a reptile to a human. They're transitioning energy. They're learning to move like these unidentified aerial phenomenon. They're using this connection to energy and space to distort or to portray or to create an image, to create a field around them. 
So um, uh, next, create a game as if it were if you were a superhero, and even create a keyword or an intro word or a thought to trigger your gift, and even adopt a pose if it seems playful. And this and it sounds funny, but this is a good way to practice telepathy. Like I like to do the 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 Spock thing, or I'll put like two fingers like I'm to my temple when I'm sitting at like Starbucks, and I'll send a message to somebody. Like I'm listening, right? Like I'm I'm tuned in. I'm going to send a message. I mean, I can hear you. So two fingers to my temple, and I'm like, and I hear the I hear that. It's like it's like you know, like it's kind of funny, but it's it's good because what you're doing is you're bringing the inspiration. You're bringing the child inside. And the child is actually the connection to the energy that will power telepathy to the highest level. That's why children can communicate so easy, even when they don't have a full language. It's kind of funny, right? Like we say, if you, if you know it, you should be able to teach it to a six-year-old. But a six-year-old can convey every single thing they need to know, and they don't know much. <laughs> I mean, they, they can get your attention, and they can get what they want, and they may not even know how to speak. So it's like babies are using telepathy all the time, because telepathy is also the projection of thought through body language, right? So, um, yeah, so creating a game. Um, also, learning how to see even the smallest aspects of your environment and to send loving intentions to animals or birds without needing recognition. So, this is a good way to start to experience um, the expression of self without the expectation, is to be in your environment, notice the smallest things, the smallest things, and send, like, I'll send, like, to that, like, if I've got a fly, I'll be like, you better get away. Or I'm going to smack you. I'm going to, I'm going to smack you with a swatter. And then I send it a couple of times and then I'll notice the fly will actually start to leave me alone. So I practice, right? Or I'll send it like there's a hummingbird that's in my backyard area and I'll send the hummingbird a message like I'm here. And then I'll notice the hummingbird starts to buzz around and I'll hear the little tweety sounds. And it's like, oh my God, the hummingbird's back. Right. And I've even got, I've even got this beautiful butterfly, this monarch that always comes down and hangs out. So, and this is a great way to start practicing the gifts and because there's no win or lose here, right? It's, it's fun because the thing is, is if we can create a connection to telepathy, that's fun and, and, and not based on functionality for the beginning, what happens is, is you don't set yourself up for failure and then you don't get disappointed because disappointment is also a telepathic signal to your inner self that you don't want to create that connection because you're afraid. So, and then another one is focus on images more than words and emotions more than detailed messages. So when you're wanting to send something, like if I'm going to, like when I'm doing readings on YouTube and I can feel someone sending me their signal, right? I've done this on Instagram. I can feel someone calling out and they need some encouragement. I don't know who it is, but I can feel somebody. And so I send that message back and then it always hits home. It always hits the person it was supposed to. I'll get a message later and say, wow, that was for me. So that's, uh, these things, we send these gifts out, we send these images out, we send these emotions out without needing to get them back. And then many times through that top level of recognition of synchronicity, we'll get them back. Um, understanding this is a process of mastering emotions more than your current state of communication. Communication is a poor way of, communica of communicating, actually. Like what we're doing right now, if I could do it with just emotion and intention, which we could if we were in a physical room um, very easily, um, we'll be able to do it by the end of this, probably a year, we'll be able to do it. We'll just be able to sit here and just everybody will have moments where we, we, we become present, become front and center, and we, we either hum or send messages to everybody else and we'll all feel it. So like a, that says, so understanding that this is a process of mastering your emotions, your emotions more than your current state of communication. And that's why you'll be able to say what you need to say, even if you can't find the words. And, you know, this is also why we attached ourselves to metaphors. And like Phil said, I'm the king of metaphors. So this is why we attach ourselves to metaphors or analogies or parables, because they are becoming a telepathic expression of self through dialogue. But we can also do this through other areas like intention, action, emotion, um, body presence, field presence, auric field and sending energetic messages like through Reiki and prayer. Um, and then also coming to terms with the idea that the message does not always need a response. And that's a big one that I have. And that's, that's what we're, we're at today. So um, basically, to increase vulnerability to the highest level, um, vulnerability, your vulnerability will increase so much more when being vulnerable doesn't um, have the uh, ramification of being a victim. 
Because being a victim means that my vulnerability is dependent upon your response. My vulnerability is dependent upon how you receive it. My vulnerability is dependent upon um, an outcome. But when I can own my vulnerability to such a level where me being vulnerable is not about anybody else. And many of you seen videos I've done in the past. I try to tap into that vulnerability as much as possible. And it's not codependent on being received. And many of you do that as well. And I think that's one of the deepest gifts that we have when it comes to being vulnerable is when we no longer are attaching it to the ability to become a victim. Being a victim isn't because you're vulnerable. Being a victim is because of unhealthy boundaries or unhealthy associations with with an outcome or with uh, a, aligned with a person or a place. So vulnerability and victimization are not even in the same ballpark. And But they've created this association because of poor communication, because most people aren't communicating telepathically and verbally on the same plane. So that's why everyone gets mixed signals. I mean, we've heard that term mixed signals so much. Mixed signals means that I'm telepathically telling you something and I'm not showing it. It's like when somebody is loving you and you know they love you, but they never, sh- they never actually show up in certain areas. Even the idea that we have love languages means that we are still dis- we're disconnected to our telepathic connection with self and, and others. So we're reverting to a category to try to identify our dysfunction. But really, we're not dysfunctional at all. All it is, is we're not learning to use our telepathy in every way possible so that we can convey the message and to receive it. And it's just also learning that um, nothing about that you share is ever detrimental. Sharing yourself, sharing your opinions, sharing your um, information is never um, dangerous in the sense of it should not, it, it's, you shouldn't be scared to do so because there's... The only thing is, is that we learn to organize the way we share things because we can feel into people telepathically to know their level of receptive receptivity to the information. So like, for instance, I'm not going to break down physics to a six-year-old. I'm going to talk to a six-year-old on a level of a six-year-old. So if I'm wanting to be vulnerable with somebody that could, that I, that I believe could be narcissistic or somebody that's not in the same field, I'm going to, to bring my message to them because I'm at the higher vibration. I'm in the higher level of awareness. So I have the capacity to come down the ladder to, to, to give my message to them in a way that's going to actually be illuminating for both. So that's, that's kind of where we're at today. Let me stop this share. And- this episode of In Deep Shift has ended, but be sure to subscribe for future conversations on topics that tie spirituality with practicality. A common sense approach to creating love, excitement, and clarity. Don't forget to like and subscribe down below.